Welcome aboard the virtual ship with Fellowship Chicago. While we can't have church traditionally, we can still be the church consistently. New method, same message. New platform, same power. New season, same God. Now, let's go into our worship experience. What's going on, family? What's going on? I thank God for you. I am so excited and elated to be back for another refuel. Wherever you are tonight, can you help me give God praise for bringing us through the month of October? Come on, put those hands together right there in your home and thank God for being a good and gracious God to all of us. Fellowship, I love you so much and there's nothing you can do about it. I want to say thank you to each of you for how you have consistently supported us throughout this pandemic. I mean, for the rest of my days, I'm going to be grateful to each and every one of you. Some of you live in Chicago. Some of you have jumped aboard the virtual ship in other states and other cities and even other countries. And so hear me tonight when I say thank you. It's coming from a deep and real, real place. I appreciate you more than you know. As always, we want to jump right into this lesson. But first, let's pray and then let's give. God, we thank you for tonight. We thank you for your Holy Spirit. We thank you for how you have spoken in every episode of these lessons called strategies. God, we pray that even tonight, even though some of the topics may be hard and challenging and make us look within, God, get the glory in everything that is said and done so that we can grow and not just stay stuck like we are. We want to grow. We want to be transformed. We want to evolve. So meet us in this discussion and spiritual conversation and get the glory and leave us with all the good. In Jesus' name we pray. Somebody shout amen. Amen and amen. Hey, those of you who are watching on YouTube or Facebook, drop those anchors to let the people know you on the virtual ship and you are ready for God to speak to your hearts tonight. Quickly, look at those seven ways to give. I want to thank you for always being a consistent giver. Thank you for being a consistent tither. And sometimes we forget, don't we? We forget, uh-oh, it's been two weeks. I forgot to give my offering. It's been three weeks. I forgot to send my tithes. That's how the church keeps selling. We have a mission here at Fellowship. We have a vision here at Fellowship to consistently take care of the people of God in our communities. And not just here in our communities, but anywhere we can be a blessing across, across the length and breadth of this country. We seek to do that. And the only way we can continue to uphold our vision and mission is through your generosity, your tithes, and your offerings. So look at those seven ways to give. Pick whichever way is most convenient for you. And I pray that as you sow your seed tonight, that you will see a harvest show up before, uh-huh, before this year is out, I pray that God will reveal to you personally that giving is always beneficial. I can't tell you how it's going to come because sometimes God gives back to us and it's not monetarily returned, uh, but it is uh, it, it's, it's returned in other ways. It can be returned in peace, in sleep, in connections, in favor, in promotions, who knows, reconciliation. You never know how what you put in the ground will be manifested back into your life. But I do know this, God loves a what kind of giver? A cheerful giver. And the word tells us if we sow sparingly, we reap sparingly. But if we sow bountifully, we will reap bountifully. I want to encourage you tonight to sow, do whatever God puts on your heart. And then let's go ahead and jump into this lesson. Man, this lesson on strategies has been life changing for me. And I've gotten text messages and DMs and even letters from members letting me know, Pastor, these lessons on strategies have been so, so helpful. And so last week, what do we talk about? Strategies. Lord, I can't even remember. Strategies for stress. We talked about two weeks ago. Uh, last week, we talked about strategies for hard decisions. And today we're going even deeper. 
deeper to talk about strategies for dealing with difficult people. Lord, have mercy. Are you ready for this? I, I mean, you ought to press share three, four, five, seven times for this lesson. You ought to let your friend know, let your relatives know. Pastor Sharp is about to talk about some spiritual strategies for dealing with difficult people. Don't we all know some difficult people? I mean, just look straight ahead if you're sitting on the couch by the difficult person. If you're in the kitchen right now with the difficult person, if you're watching this at work and the cubicle right next to you, there sits a difficult person. I don't know where that person is for you. But before we leave this life, we will all deal with difficult people and, and we're going to find out momentarily that sometimes that difficult person is us. Uh-oh. Sometimes we are that difficult person. But what do you do? How do you make it? When you can't escape it, you can't run from it, you can't block and delete them because they're family, or you can't block and delete them because they're a coworker, they're a church member, there's somebody, there's a person in the community that you have to work with. What happens when the difficult person is your mama and your daddy? What happens when the difficult person is your child? What happens when the difficult person is your boo or your bae? What happens when the difficult person is your supervisor or your boss? I'm talking about when when you are in a situation in your life and you cannot run away, escape, delete or block or get rid of them quickly and you have to learn how to navigate your life dealing with difficult people. Let's describe these difficult people. What are they? Sometimes they show up as leeches. They're always pulling from you. Sometimes these difficult people can be draining or uh, they always make it about them or this person is selfish or they lie often or they never keep their promises they're unkind they're inconsiderate they're tactless they say the truth but they say it in a way that's so harsh and hard that it's hard to receive it they hold grudges often they told you that they forgave you but they still bringing up what happened three months ago or three years ago they're demeaning or condescending always speaking down to you they're arrogant they're angry all the time they, they, they only think that they are right uh -huh. they're chaotic everywhere they go they, they stir up chaos they they keep drama going they they're, they're dealing with fighting addictions or drug abuse and that's hard and difficult uh, to watch a person continue to be in a circular cycle that they can't break or they're not trustworthy or they're worrisome or they're not dependable or they're manipulative they always find a way to turn it back on you or they talk too much or they hold too much in because they don't know how to communicate well or they're hellish mm -hmm. it means just what it says just full of you know what uh-huh and they're mean or short-tempered or they're short-sighted they're only looking at what they see right now and can't see a bigger picture difficult people i know in this long litany this long list you saw some people come to mind and say yep i've seen that yep i've seen that yep i know that one yep because we all have to deal with difficult people and what god has allowed me to do in this quick lesson is give some strategies tonight to help us understand what we ought to do these strategies as the lessons have been before are typical uh, excuse me not typical but rather practical lessons and and strategies that you can put in your daily life first before we jump into the bible i want to offer you three books that i believe can be beneficial to you as you learn how to deal with difficult people do you remember deborah pagay deborah pagay who wrote the book taming the tongue well she has another book called confronting without offending i want to recommend that book to you because sometimes you cannot avoid hard conversations or even confrontations but you can do it without being offensive go grab that book confronting without offending there's another book by desmond tutu bishop desmond tutu he wrote a book many years ago called no future without forgiveness mm-hmm because what happens when you've had an encounter with a difficult person and now you're holding on to some animosity and resentment and unforgiveness and he argues in the book that there is no future if you don't learn how to forgive. Go grab that book. And there's another book, I can't think of the author's name, but it'll pop up on the screen momentarily. It's called Surrounded by Idiots. Uh huh. Four behavior types that you have to learn to deal with. Somebody's going to order that book right now, right now, right now. Surrounded by Idiots. 
idiots. What do I do when I am surrounded by idiots? No future without forgiveness, confronting without offending. Some of these books have offered some of the wisdom that I seek to share with you tonight. So here, here are about four principles, strategies that I want to give you when you are in the midst of dealing with difficult people. Are y'all ready to dive in? We're diving in on the 10-foot side of the pool. This is not the kiddie pool tonight. It's about to be real raw and relevant and only if you're ready will you get what God wants to deposit into your spirit so on three say ready one two three ready let's go number one when you're dealing with difficult people you need a moment of self contemplation somebody say self contemplation self contemplation contemplative moments contemplation it means to think hard about a thing for a long time self contemplation it's another word for deep self reflection introspection preacher what you talking about what you talking about i thought you were talking about dealing with difficult people yeah but the problem is you cannot deal with difficult people if you don't look within yourself first mhm psalm 139 my favorite scripture of all in all the bible if anybody ever asks you what's pastor charles favorite scripture you don't have to go wondering it's psalm 139 it's so many layers to this text look how david opens up in in in, in verse one verse one of psalm 139 he says oh lord you have searched me and known me you know when i sit down and when i rise up you discern my thoughts from a far away you search out my path and my lying down down and are acquainted with all my ways david is literally saying oh lord i need you to search me go deep into the corridors of my consciousness walk around the museum of my mind walk down the hallways of my heart go within me god and help me figure out what's going on in me because if everybody is getting on your nerves it ain't everybody sometimes is you if you are having an issue with everybody in your life, you can't get along with anybody at home, at work, at your, everywhere you go, mess follows you, drama follows you, some argument follows you, it's time to look within. I never will forget, I talk about my first pastor, Reverend H.F. Shepherd, and his wife, who's still alive, Miss Ivory Collins Shepherd. Her health is a little more fragile than it used to be, but Miss Ivory Collins Shepherd changed my life in 2006 I started preaching April 12 2006 my first pastor passed May 30th 2006 so I didn't get a lot of time with him but God allowed his wife to stay alive and she poured so much wisdom into me and many of the quotes that I share often in ministry while preaching and teaching come from Mrs. Ivory Collins Shepherd. I, I, I think I'm going to put a picture up just so you can get a face with the name because I talk about her so much. Miss Ivory Collins Shepherd. she was my very first first lady and one day I asked her as a young preacher I said now you've been walking by your husband you all were married 47 years he passed her for 47 years at one church how did you deal with the difficult people in the congregation I know it wasn't easy being a first lady you know what she told me she said I started praying years ago that which I dislike in another person I try to correct it within myself ain't that heavy that which I dislike in another person, I try to check it within myself. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians verse 13, chapter 13, verse 5, that literally before communion, Paul warns the family of God, before you take communion, Paul uses this language, examine yourself. Don't even participate in communion if you don't have your business straight with your brothers and your sisters. How are you going to have communion with God and you not right in communion with the family of God? Uh huh. He says, examine yourself. Look within. So before we go, well, this person did this, and he did that, and they said this, and they were wrong about that. Paul's self contemplation. That which I dislike in other people, you got to correct it within yourself. If you don't like people lying, don't be a liar. <laughs> if you don't like people showing up late, don't you show up late. If you don't like people not keeping their promises, be a person that keeps their promises. If you don't like a person that's always talking and gossiping about other folks, don't be a gossiper. Whatever you don't like in somebody else, instead of spending your energy to check them and change them, do what David and Paul said, search yourself. 
Look within and make sure that you are not the difficult person that somebody is in Bible study learning how to deal with. <laughs> make sure you aren't the difficult husband that cannot communicate effectively with your wife. Make sure you aren't the difficult child, the difficult mother, the difficult church member, the difficult leader, the difficult boss, the difficult supervisor, the difficult co-worker who everybody else is in Bible study right now trying to get lessons on how to deal with you. Because it ain't always everybody else sometimes is right here. That which I dislike in another person. Come on, help me. I have to correct it. Where? Within myself. So the first strategy I need you to do, and I need you to really do this. Look within. And, and contemplation doesn't mean I just think quick. No, no. Really search and examine. Analyze. Ask your friends. Ask your... But you know what? I may not move to another strategy tonight because this thing is good to me. Listen, uh, but because literally, here's the problem. If you, if you spend all your time trying to check other folks... You will have a little time to really grow and evolve yourself. I'll never forget, my wife is a fan of Sister Soldier. I don't know if you ever heard of her. Uh, she doesn't write uh, very spiritual books, but she's an author, and my wife is a fan. And so she got to meet Sister Soldier once and, and wanted to get Sister Soldier to sign a copy of a book that she purchased. This is back in 2013. And my wife called me. I told y'all this story before, just act like you never heard it. So my wife called me and said, I met Sister Soldier, and she signed my book, and you won't believe what she wrote in the front cover. I said, well, what did she write? She asked the question, how does your love feel to the person you call yourself loving? The only way you will know how your love feels to the person you call yourself loving is to look within, to ask, how does my love feel? How does it feel for me to be your mama? How does it feel for me to be your leader? How does it feel for me to be your husband? How, how does my love feel? And you've got to be humble enough. Y'all, I'm trying to help somebody tonight. And I don't know if y'all listening. You've got to be humble enough to ask people, how does it feel? I never will forget. Uh, early this year, last year, I've asked my staff right here at Fellowship, how does it feel to be walking with my leadership what does my leadership feel like because i can think it's one thing but 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 everybody's like lord jesus we all over i don't know what we're doing we all over the place and you have to create a space for you to examine yourself or else you will be the difficult person and nobody will tell you because they'll all be afraid of how you'll respond mm -hmm. so you got to be humble enough. i'm talking about pastors leaders fathers mother i don't care where you are in your life i dare you to ask the group that's around you the family that you love how does my love feel to you how does my compassion feel to you how, am i a good listener how does am, am i okay am i doing how can i be better you ought to ask yourself that and, and even if you can't ask others ask yourself look within and examine yourself. Yeah, I don't spend too much time on this tonight because I, I I don't know. Maybe that's the only strategy there is because we always looking out and God is like, no, look within. Look at yourself. So that's the first one. Self-contemplation. Everybody say that with me. Self-contemplation. Here's the second one. You have to learn how to have healthy conversations. Come on, healthy conversations. Somebody say, I got to learn how to talk right. I, I've got to learn how to talk right. Matthew 18. Here it is. It's such a simple scripture. And this is the one scripture I believe that nobody believes in the Bible. This is the one scripture that I am convinced that nobody believes in the Bible. Here it is. Here it is. Here it is. Uh, Matthew 18. Verse uh, 15, I'm going to start at verse 15 just to give you some context. Jesus is talking. Let's see if we can listen to Jesus. Uh huh. Matthew 18, verse 15, 16, 17. Here it is out of the New Revised Standard Version. If another member of the church sins against you, go and point out the fault when the two of you are alone. If the member listens to you, you have regained that one. But if you are not listened to, take one or two others along with you so that every word may be confirmed by the evidence of two or three witnesses. Verse 17, if the member refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if the offender refuses to listen even to the church, let such one be to you as a Gentile or a tax collector. This is the simple scripture that says if your brother or your sister offends you, does anything to... Uh, 
you know, get on your nerves, if they cross you the wrong way, if you're bothered by something, go to them alone. You understand why I said this is the one scripture I believe nobody believes? Because <laughs> this is the one scripture a lot of us get completely wrong. How have you talked to five or six other people about the person who hurt your feelings and the person who hurt your feelings still don't know? You are not an effective communicator. What you have done is created drama, mess, and started gossip. But what you have not done is effectively had a conversation that can lead to healing and reconciliation. So if you got to deal with a difficult person, listen, what's the strategy? Have a conversation. Oh, my goodness. Sharp, that's all you got from me? You have to learn how to have a conversation. Lean up and stop being the person talking about, well, I don't like conflict. I don't like, I don't like drama. Well, you doing it anyway. <laughs> you, you, it, it, you, 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 you causing it anyway. Watch this. You either going to cause it by talking about it to somebody else or it's inside of you creating a conflict. So you're walking around, you just by yourself, walking around, holding on to the baggage, holding on to all the drama. I wasn't supposed to get up, but see, I started moving. Let me get the camera straight. Here I am. I'm still, y'all. Here you are. You know, you, 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 you walking around with inward conflict. So either you're going to have inward conflict by yourself or you're going to learn how to be an adult, man up, woman up, and face conflict. Because the Bible says in Genesis 1 that even God created the cosmos out of chaos. So new worlds can only happen out of chaos. So you can't run from conflict and chaos because that's where the new world is coming from. Am I making sense? You can't even get a new reality if you don't embrace and confront the adversity. So I'm talking to the people now who choose silent treatment for two weeks over and open, rather than opening your mouth sharing. You know you hurt my feelings when you said that. And, and, here, and, here, and here's the strategy. Here's the strategy. Here's the strategy. Always begin tough conversations with I. When you did this, I felt. When you said this, I heard. When you did da 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 da, I didn't appreciate. See, when you put it back on you, it's no longer war. You better not ever do. See, right there, there go World War Three. It's going down like four flats in the rain, and I mean, it's about to be a thunderstorm. You, if you ever, right there, right there, right there, that's called war. That this means war. As soon as you say, you better not ever. I bet you bet all that. War. It's war. It's warfare. It ain't forget a conversation. You getting ready for crucifixion. Mm -hmm. As soon as you look at them and say, you when you better and, 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 and I'm going to need you. See, no, no, no. Bring it right back here because the issue is not the issue. The issue is how you feel about the issue. Because the issue, the same thing that you went through can happen to somebody else and they just rolled off their back like a duck. But the issue is how you felt about it. So lean up, lean up. I'm about to give you some strategies. And I've said it before. I'm going to keep saying it till one day everybody catches it. When you are having a tough conversation, always begin with this. Help me understand. Because if you have understanding, you can stand under it. You can always stand under what you understand. But what you don't understand, you ain't going to stand nowhere near it. <laughs> yeah, you're not going to make it. Because there's no understanding. And so the goal of a confrontation or a hard conversation is not to win it. It's to come out of it with understanding. Are you understanding what I'm saying to you? See, you can win an argument and lose the relationship. Well, congratulations. You made your point. And there's blood everywhere. You can win and lose at the same time. That's not the goal of a conversation. The goal is understanding so that when you deal with it again, things can be better the next time. Are y'all hearing me here? Now, see, some of y'all grew up in houses on the west side. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. It don't matter whether you're on the south side or west side. I'm just kidding. But some of y'all on the west side, you know, it's blood everywhere now. It's blood. South side, y'all know what I'm talking about. It, it's blood. We're not going to stop till the jugular vein is slit. And if that's your goal to kill yeah, you, you, you're going to lose every relationship. Everything can't be warfare. Sometimes you have to have a conversation in a tone that's healthy 
and, and get to a place of understanding. Here's another gift I want to give you. Uh, this came from a book my wife introduced me to, and, and I want I want y'all to get this, and I'm almost wrapping up this lesson because it's just too deep. My wife told me about this book called Set Boundaries, Comma, Find Peace, A Guide to Reclaiming Yourself. It's called Set Boundaries, Find Peace, A Guide to Reclaiming Yourself. And so she argues in this book, when you set boundaries... That helps you with people. Everybody shouldn't be all up in your business in the first place. Some of us, the reason you're in a confrontation in the first place is because you let them get way too close to you. My grandma would say like this, some folk you got to handle with a long handle spoon. Have you ever heard that before? Yeah, everybody can't be right up on you and have access to everything and talking to you about everything. No, you got to have a boundary. And they say when those boundaries are crossed, when people are going too far, saying too much, doing too much. You ever heard that in, in the colloquialisms in our day and time? Uh, she doing too much. Whenever they start doing too much, this is what you say. Uh, you say back to them, I want you to. I need you to or I expect you. So right there, you, you see what I'm doing? I want I want you to let me know, da-da-da-da-da. I want you to uh, make sure that you let me know when you're about to be late instead of just showing up late. I need you to uh, be accountable. I need you. See, right there, that's you, you, you're coming from a personal place and a mature place. I want, I need, I expect. And whenever you share with somebody you're in a healthy relationship, I need, I want, or I expect, if they respect you, they will respect what you expect. Uh -huh. And if they can't respect what you expect, what you need, or what you want, then we're going to get to that in a minute. Ain't no, listen, no longer are we going to talk about self-contemplation or, or conversation. Now we got to talk about cancellation. Because some relationships cannot work because you cannot respect what I need, what I want, and what, I, what, I, what, what I'm expecting from you. We would, it's no understanding. You, you done went and told 15 people, they ain't talked to me yet. You, you know, we, we talked about something, tried to get understanding, and you went back on your work. See, sometimes in these difficult people relationships, you got to understand it ain't always going to work out. It's not always going to work out. I said it last year uh, in October because every October I spend time teaching about domestic violence. This is Domestic Violence Awareness Month and there are all kinds of violence. Physical violence, emotional abuse, physical abuse, verbal abuse, financial abuse, psychological abuse, spiritual abuse, mental abuse. It's, all, it's a lot of different types of abuse. And so I said last year, some of you are Remember, sometimes divorce is necessary. Oh, you would have thought I said you just walk up to people and slap them whenever you get ready. I mean, you would have thought you would have thought I said you would have thought I said heaven's not real and heaven and hell's not real. Uh, you know the way people responded because it, it was just counterintuitive. I'm not as your pastor gonna sit here and condemn you if you're in an unhealthy marriage and relationship for bringing it to an end. Here's another book. It's called Necessary Endings by Henry Cloud. Because sometimes things need to come to an end. Preacher, you got Bible for this? I talked about self-contemplation. I talked about how to have a conversation and healthy communication. But what do you do with the difficult people when it's now time for cancellation? Now watch this before I go further. I'm wrapping this up. Before I go further on cancellation, our culture teaches go to cancellation first. This is what you call cancel culture. Somebody ticks you off, block them. <laughs> Somebody says something you don't like, delete them. Somebody cross you the wrong way, unfriend them. That's the kind of culture we live in. That's not biblical. The Bible says if you have an alt with your brother or sister, go to them. At least try to work it out. And even if you all can't work it out alone, then in Matthew, Jesus said, bring two or three witnesses to help you come to a place of understanding. And then he says, now, if that doesn't work, treat them like a Gentile or a tax collector, which is to be interpreted. Treat them like somebody who has more to learn. Treat them like a Gentile because Jesus was talking to a Jewish community. Matthew is the most Jewish book of all the Gospels. And he said, just treat them like a Gentile. Somebody that's not a Jew and they haven't fully come to the full understanding of the ways of God. That's what he's saying in context. Treat them like a Gentile or a tax collector. That's somebody who still needs grace, got some more growing to do, have some more learning to do. So that means just push them off to the side and give them space to grow. That don't mean cut them off. It just I'm going to put, see, see some people. 
Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I ain't going to cut you off, but I'm going to sure push you back. <laughs> You're not going to have access to me. No, 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 no. Sometimes you do have to block people. Sometimes you do have to screen phone calls. Sometimes you can't respond to everything. I'm not going to cut you off, but I'm going to push you back. Somebody ought to write in the chat. I ain't going to cut you off, but I'm going to push you back. No, you're not going to rob me of all my energy. You're not. No, 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 no. In every crowd, you got critics and you got the committed. Stop spending your time on critics when God has sent you people who are committed. You got to Lord, teach sharp. I'm trying. You're spending too much energy. You're not going to rob me of all my joy and all my energy and all my smiles and all my happiness just because you stuck on stupid. No, I'm going to let you stay stuck on whatever gear you stuck on. I'm not going to cut you off, but I'm going to push you back. But then there are times when cut off is necessary. What do you mean, Sharp? What do you mean? Here it is. Cancellation. Acts chapter 15. Paul, who wrote over half of the New Testament, had a moment where he had to experience cancellation. He had to cancel somebody. It was a cutoff. It was a breach of, uh, of connection. It wasn't going to work out. Watch this. Watch this. Paul and Barnabas. They were brothers in ministry, walking together. Acts chapter 15, verse 36. R watch this. After some days, Paul said to Barnabas, come, let us return and visit the believers in every city where we've proclaimed the word of the Lord and see how they're do doing. Barnabas wanted to take with them John called Mark. But Paul decided not to take with them one who had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not accompanied them in the work. So John Mark had been trifling. And Paul said, no, nah, bro, John Mark ain't coming with us. No, he go with you. He ain't coming with us because he deserted us and he did not help us when we were in Pamphylia. Now watch what happens. So Paul wants to go forward and not take John Mark. And then Barnabas wants to go forward and take John Mark. But Paul is concerned because John called Mark has not been faithful in the past. So what we're going to do now, verse 39, the dis disagreement became so sharp that they parted company. And Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed to Cyprus. But Paul chose Silas and set out to the believers commending him to the grace of the Lord. Did you see that right there? Sometimes it just ain't going to work out. And it's okay. Because John, Mark, and Barnabas are going to do the work of the Lord over there. And me and Silas are going to go over here and do the work of the Lord over here. See, sometimes you've got to be at peace with things coming to an end. I, I, I don't know who this is for. Whether it be a breakup, divorce, going to a new season. Whatever that is for you, sometimes difficult people are so difficult that there will be no reconciliation. Or there will be reconciliation, watch this, but there will be no reconnection. So I can reconcile with you and say, hey, I forgive you, I'm over it, I'm going to let it go. But that don't mean we're going to be where we used to be. That don't mean we're going out to eat tonight. That don't mean we're going to get hot dogs and milkshakes tonight. That means I have forgiven you, I'm going to let you go, I'm going to release you. But I also have to, I, I can't reconnect with you because we're not on the same page anymore. And the hardest, I saw a Facebook post the other day that said, the hardest decision some of us have to make is learning whether to cross a bridge or learning rather to burn the bridge. Do I cross this bridge with you or do I burn this bridge with you? Because sometimes some bridges are going to be burned, whether you do it or they do it, and you've got to be at peace. So what happens now when it's not going to work out? What happens when divorce happens? What happens now when breakups happen? What happens now when it doesn't work out? You have to embrace the stages of grief because now there's a loss of a relationship that used to be fruitful and helpful. I'm trying to help somebody tonight. I don't know who this is for, but I'm trying to tell you, as soon as it doesn't work out, you are now in a grieving season. And the stages of grief are how you survive your breakup and that disconnection. And that means I got to stop following you on social media. It may mean I have to stop watching everything you post because I need time to heal from what we used to have. Because everything doesn't have to be messy and a tornado and, and, and evil and I'm mad at you and I resent you. No, no, no. I just need space. I ain't got to cut you off, but I need space from you so that you have time to heal over there with your Barnabas and your John Mark. And I need time to go over here and heal with Paul and Silas. 
Am I making sense? I'm wrapping this thing up. But the stages of grief include denial. It's going to be hard. You're going to bargain. Well, what if we had done this? Well, what if we had tried this? What if we had done this? Stages of grief, you're going to be angry for a while. Stages of grief, there's going to be some depression. And stages of grief are not linear. It doesn't mean denial, then bargaining, then depression, then anger. No, 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 no. It just, you just, every day is different. But you have to trust God that eventually you'll get to that last stage called acceptance. Somebody say acceptance. 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 That's when you are saying, now, Lord, this has hurt me. This has broken me. But I'm learning to accept the fact that this season has come to a close and it's going to be all right. So I'm, I want to help you today. Look within. Learn how to have healthy conversations and communication and then be open if some relationships just don't work out. Stop judging people for the choices they had to make. For the, you don't know how difficult of a season it was. Don't judge people for where they are. What you know, decisions they had to make that were hard. If, they, if there was a cutoff, if there was a period placed in the relationship, only them and God know. You know, because we, we see this like it happened quickly. This could have lasted for days for Paul and Barnabas. They could have gone months arguing over we're going to keep John or not. We don't know how long this went on. But eventually they parted ways and they both continued in ministry, which means you can have a meaningful life even after the cancellation. So I, I pray now for those of you who are in jobs that are difficult, in marriages that are difficult, in relationships in your family that are difficult, at churches, you're serving in leadership positions, and it's difficult. God says, I have the wisdom that you need. I have the power and the peace that you need. And I need for you to do whatever you got to do to become healthy enough to make sure you position yourself to be open to the move of the Holy Spirit. There used to be an old song that said, Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary pure and holy tried and true and with thanksgiving I'll be a living sanctuary Lord for you that's our prayer tonight let's pray God thank you for this word we've gone over our time tonight but God I pray that you would speak into the hearts of your people to help them be who you want them to be it's hard out here especially when we're in difficult relationships and have to live and operate with difficult people. But Lord, you know all about it. And your word tells us that you uh, will let no weapon formed against us be able to prosper. Your word tells us we don't have to spend our energy on this and fret not ourselves because of evil doers and neither be thou envious because of the workers of iniquity for they shall soon be cut down. God, if there are malicious, evil hearted people around us seeking to destroy us, God give us peace, give us rest and give us ease that you're going to help us and you're going to solve it. In the name of Jesus, give us clarity, give us direction, give us peace. And we need you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. If you need Christ tonight, come on. He's the one that can help you deal with these difficult places. Come to Christ tonight. Uh, give your life to Christ tonight. Join a church where you can be taught the word of God and get some strategies that can help you in difficult places so that you can become a living sanctuary where people come to you to find peace. People come to you to find wisdom. People come to you to find strength. Come on. Lord, prepare me. Come on, it's right there. Email us, text us. And I'm thankful for this lesson tonight. A little more lengthier than usual, but Lord knows it was some good stuff that can help you with some strategies of moving forward. Come on to Christ. Join the church. I would love to be your pastor. Lord, prepare me. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy. Come on, tried and true. With thanksgiving, I'll be a living sanctuary for you, for you. Lord, prepare me. Lord, prepare me. Yeah, to be a sanctuary. Sing it with me. Pure and holy, tried and true, tried and true. And with thanksgiving. I'll be a living sanctuary, sanctuary for you, for you, oh Lord prepare me, yeah, to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, pure and holy, tried and true, tried and true, 
and with thanksgiving I'll be, I'll be a living sanctuary, sanctuary for you. One more time for you. Oh, Lord, prepare me hey, to be a sanctuary. Come on, let me hear you. Pure and holy, tried and true, tried and true. And with thanksgiving, I'll be a living sanctuary for you, for you. Here's my prayer tonight that God will give you the wisdom and the strategies that you need to deal with difficult people. One more time, let's show tonight, wherever you are, I, I commend you, I implore you, I welcome you, I advise you to sow into God's house so that you can recreate blessings and manifestation and the favor of God on your life. I'm not making it up, it's Bible. Can we thank God for Elder Mark Moore who preached and blessed us on Sunday, Lord have mercy. The man of God came through here like a hurricane, a category five hurricane, and I'm so blessed that you all were blessed. Thank you, Elder Moore, wherever you are tonight, may God continue to richly favor your life and we can't wait to invite you back to the ship next time i'm gonna have to be here so that i can benefit in-house what god is doing through your ministry in your life and then fellowship thank you for being a mature church and understanding that god's word can come through anybody that we can't create an idol out of our pastor that we have to be open from men and women of god for god to speak to us right where we are now May your struggles keep you near the cross. May your troubles show that you need God. May your battles end the way they should. And may your bad days prove that God is good. I pray your whole life proves that God is good. I love you, fellowship, and there's nothing you can do about it. I'll see you Sunday on the virtual ship or in person. Make sure you register online at fellowshipchicago.com to secure your seat. I'll see you soon, and I love you. Peace, peace. Sisters, it's time to rev up those engines and prepare for Women's World Day of Prayer 2021. Are you ready for the victory lap? Please join us right here at Fellowship Chicago on Sunday, October 31st and Monday, November 1st at 10 a.m. as we declare and decree victory over our families, our finances, our careers, our health, and our city. Our special guests include First Lady Emerita, Dr. Tara Jenkins, April Ryan and Evangelist Sandra Riley of Just For You Ministries and many more powerhouse speakers. For more information and to register, visit www.fellowshipchicago.com. You don't want to miss this opportunity to claim victory over your lives. Thank you for worshiping with Fellowship Chicago on the virtual ship. We've always had a commitment of service and during this season, we've increased our efforts to serve you better. We have made it easy for you to stay connected to get the complete resources you need. You can email us at info at fellowshipchicago.com. Call the church office Tuesday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. at 773-924-3232. And our social media on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. For real-time updates, you can text Fellowship Chicago to 55949. We have exciting and informative resources throughout the entire week designed specifically with you in mind. Go to fellowshipchicago.com for the full schedule. Until we dock again, thank you for your prayers and financial support of Fellowship Chicago. Remember, we are in this together. Shock your spirit. <laughs>